The workshop was waiting for the master's return. Samia was working on knife blanks and worried about Izo. When he was leaving, she asked him to be careful and promised that he would definitely come home. But now she didn't have a moment of peace in her soul. She was thinking about what was happening to the blacksmith right now. This did not escape Reich's eyes, and she laughed. Samia tensed up and said she wasn't thinking about Izo at all. Diana said that it was not surprising that Samia was worried, because she was the one who dragged the head of their family into her problems, and therefore she herself was also heavy-hearted. Samia turned to Diana and said that she was much more worried about her. She said that family was something very complicated, and she didn't quite understand people, but she understood that it was also important to Diana. Diana was touched, and the girls hugged her. Meanwhile, Izo was working at the blacksmith shop to create a false family heirloom. He already had a sword ready, but he felt that the result was not what he wanted. The environment in which he was, of course, was different from his usual one. But he was focused, and did not plan to create just a unique sword, the quality should have been much higher. Camillo, who was present at the forge, noticed the change in expression and asked Izo what happened. Izo replied that he hadn't finished yet, and decided to try out the sword. He cut a bunch of hay on a chopping board, but the sword will only be able to awaken the greens themselves. Camillo was surprised by such sharpness, but Izo understood that the sword was the level of an average quality model. He took out his knife, which he wore at his belt, and demonstrated that this small blade cuts through not only a bunch of greens, but also the cutting board itself after. Camillo was amazed. The knife didn't even make a sound, he could cut the tree so easily. Izo said that he usually gets such sharp things out without difficulty. Camillo replied that he now understood why he did not take individual orders. Such sharp things should not fall into the hands of amateurs. Izo decided to start making another sword. Camillo asked him what to do with the previous one, and the blacksmith replied that he could take it for himself, but then he added that he would sell it at a discount. The merchant was already glad that he had received a good sword for free, and disappointed. He told Izo that he was a real blacksmith, and would never give up his own benefits. Izo made two more knives, but they also came out of the middle level, and were inferior to high-quality models. He looked at his knife, and the one that had just turned out, with the help of his gift, and Scan noticed that the knife that he had made in his forge was distinguished by a special radiance. It turns out that his products shone so brightly when he put his soul into them. How then would he be able to make a high-quality sword from local materials? After thinking it over, Izo threw his pocket knife into the fire. Then he divided the knife into pieces, wrapped them in a thin, damp linen cloth and covered them with straw ashes. Then, having melted the pieces stacked on fire, and after cooling, forged an entire ingot. He decided that since he couldn't get the quality from local materials, he would make his own knife, which was already distinguished by its bright radiance. Then he began to make a thin, elegant long sword out of a thick ingot. He heated, then cut, folded back, struck again with a hammer and heated. When hitting, he decided that after 15 times, the real work would finally begin. He used his strength and sharpened his senses to the limit to deliver precise blows and knock out the shape of the sword. A few hours later, the sword was ready. Now it was necessary to design it. The relic of the Count's family had to be very beautiful. He began to carve the pattern, trying to make it look like the Count's family sword. He didn't want it to really look like a fake in appearance, and he had no right to spoil it. After that, he placed a small emblem of his forge on the tip of the sword hilt, and so that it could not be seen by outsiders, he covered it with leather. The sword was completely finished and decorated. It remained to make a scabbard, but Izo was so tired that he fell asleep. The habits of the past world remained with him. After working too hard, he fell asleep right at the workplace. Marius went into the workshop and picked up the sword, finally waiting for Izo to make it. Marius said with admiration that the sword was beautiful. Izo replied that it took him an entire evening to finish the scabbard, but he managed. The future count decided to try the sword and made several lunges with it. Izo thought that his fighting technique was the same as Diana's. Marius said once again that everything was fine and it was the best sword he had ever held in his hands. Izo proudly said that his swords are the best and will never be inferior to others. Marius said he couldn't bring himself to call this sword a fake. He thanked Izo and told him that he could go to rest, and he would pick him up tomorrow. Izo had already thought that he would finally go home tomorrow, but it turned out that everything was not as he expected. He woke up ready to leave, but Marius came into his room with his maids and told him to change into a suit. Now he looked like a northern aristocrat, and was sitting at a family meeting, on Marius' side as a witness. Marquis Menzel, who is the owner of the mansion they arrived at, negotiated as the deciding person who would determine which of the two brothers would get the title of Count. 
According to the rumors that Izo heard, the Marquis was a close friend of the previous Count Aimer. So, Marquis Menzel said that he had heard that Lord Carroll had returned the stolen family sword, and asked the audience if they wanted him to put forward a solution. Carroll said that he actually managed to get it back yesterday near the border. Marquis Menzel said that in that case it was necessary for Marius to inherit the title of Count. But Carroll said that a man who had a family heirloom stolen and couldn't find it in return it was unworthy of the title of Count. Izo thought that exactly what Marius had predicted had begun. The Marquis said Carol's words were reasonable. Then Marius spoke, and the Marquis allowed him to speak. The young man said that he wanted to declare that the sword Carol found was a fake. Carol said loudly that this couldn't be happening. Marius took out the sword made by Izo and told the others that it was a real relic of the Amor family. The Marquis asked Carol to remain calm and then asked Marius to explain himself. Marius said that from the documents his father left him, it follows that the Eimer family often use spare swords for ceremonial and many other purposes. It turns out that the real sword was completely different. Also, the document said that the one who brings the real sword will inherit the title. He handed the letter into the Marquis's hands. The man looked at the scroll and said that it was indeed the handwriting of his deceased friend. Izo thought that Marius had carefully prepared himself, since he was able to forge a letter from his father, and then turned to Camillo and saw him wink imperceptibly at him. It was clear that this was the work of a merchant. Marius told the Marquis that Camillo's brother had left by the time he received the letter, and could not inform him about it earlier, since they had not seen each other since, and today was their first meeting after Camillo left their house. Marquis Menzel asked Camillo if he had any objections. Carol remained silent, and then the Marquis said that since there were no objections and problems, he would report the decision to the king. Then Carol said that he could not believe that his sword was a fake. Izo and Camillo sighed, Marius had checkmated his brother, and it was difficult to resist him. Marius said out loud that if there were still doubts, they could check the swords. They went out into the courtyard, and the guard began to hit Marius's sword with a spear. After the first blow, the tip of the spear was broken off. Marquis Menzel said that nothing else was expected from the sword presented by his majesty. There was not a single scratch on it, it was incomparably beautiful and durable. The Marquis snapped his fingers for the guard to start checking the second sword. Marius said it wasn't necessary. He walked forward, and pulling his sword out of the ground, struck at the real relic, called a fake. The sword split in two, signifying Carol's final loss. Marius said that the sharpness of his sword is incomparable, and no one can doubt that he has a real sword in his hand. The Marquis said that without a doubt, this sword would surely inspire terror to opponents on the battlefield. Silent tears flowed down Carol's face, but no one paid any attention to him. Marquis Menzel said that in this case, the problem with the inheritance of the title has been solved. He will inform His Majesty that Marius will become the new Count of Aimer. At that moment, Carol ran hysterically at his brother with a knife. But Morris turned in time and, with a cold blooded expression on his face, struck Carol with his sword. Tears gushed from the wounded man's eyes in an even more violent stream, and he fell to the ground. Marius knelt down on one knee in front of the Marquis and asked for forgiveness for having stained the garden of his house with blood. He lowered his head and said he deserved to be punished. Marquis Menzel replied that he had only killed a deceiver and a thief, so he should be worried, and then called him Count Marius. Izo and Camillo were surprised that the Marquis recognized Marius as a count so quickly, and they were bitter that Carol was called a deceiver and a thief. They returned to the house, leaving the corpse on the street. When a blow is struck, there are always bitter thoughts in my head. Thus, Marius inherited the earldom. Because of Carol's act, his name was blackened. Marius discussed further actions with Lord Menzel. During the discussion, it was decided not to make Carol's death and his deeds public. It was necessary to take measures to ensure that no one had any suspicions about his absence. The Amer family secretly took the corpse and buried it in the cemetery. Izo was thinking about Diana. He was worried about what her reaction would be when she found out that one of her brothers had killed another. He changed into his usual artisan clothes, and Marius's maids laughed at the fact that such clothes were more to the man's liking than the clothes provided by the Count. Then he came to Marius's office, where the young man and Camilla were waiting for him. Marius thanked them for all the help they had provided and said that due to circumstances, he could not yet give them a huge reward. But still, he would like to express his gratitude to them somehow. Camillo said he didn't do anything special, it was nothing. He didn't need much, he just wanted to continue doing business with the Marius house. Izo said he would like to get information about rare ores. She doesn't have to be in Marius's arms, he can just pass the information through Camillo. Marius was surprised, and asked what kind of metals he meant, like mithril. 
Izo said that was it. Marius said he would try to find information, and shook Iso's hand. In fact, he put a bag of money in his hand. The blacksmith wanted to refuse, but he understood from the Count's look that he would be upset if he did not accept the reward, so he took the money. Izo left the Amor estate, still in Camillo's cart. They returned to the Black Forest to bring Diana back to celebrate the new Earl of Amor. Camillo left Izo on the trail, and he walked with a torch in his hands through the night forest. Finally, the blacksmith reached his house. It seemed to him that he had not been here for a very long time. Now he felt that he missed his family very much. All three girls went out into the courtyard as soon as Samia, with the help of her moccasin hearing, heard Izo's footsteps from afar. Everyone greeted the head of the family with a smile. After that, they sat down at a common table in the house, and the blacksmith told about what happened on his trip. Diana clasped her hands, and sadly said that Carol often played with her when they were children. He was on good terms with his father, and with his brother Rion, and of course, with his brother Marius. It hurt her that it had ended like this, and she gave way to tears the girls began to comfort their friend. And Izo thought that he had forged a new sword for the Amor family and this sword took the life of Diana's brother. The girl apologized and said she shouldn't have cried. Izo said that Diana shouldn't worry. He wouldn't be able to get along with a man who would behave calmly when he was told that his own brother was dead. And no matter who a person is before death, after that everyone is equal. Then he added that Carol's death would be kept a closely guarded secret. So if you need to cry, it's better for Diana to do it right now, before they go to the celebration. He informed Diana that he would take her to the estate tomorrow, and he himself would also have to attend the celebration. Reich asked how many days Izo would be gone, and she assumed that he would be gone for about two or three days. Izo said that was probably the case, and apologized to Samia and Reich that he would leave them alone at home. Reich replied that she would wait for him calmly, but Samia might start to worry if Izo didn't hurry home. The tigress was indignant and exclaimed that this was not true. Diana laughed, feeling better watching her friends. They arrived in the city in Camillo's cart. Diana hid her face under the hood of her robe so that no one in the city would look in their direction. Residents were already preparing for the holiday with might and main, arranging a whole festival on the streets. They arrived at the manor and Diana, throwing off her hood, ran into the arms of the only survivor, her brother. Meanwhile, Izo was talking to Camillo. He told him that he was able to explore the city better this time, and noticed that there were many different races living here. Camillo said that there were many people with different skin tones living here, as well as beastmen and dwarves. That's not all. Many said that the large gate at the entrance to the city was proof that the kings of the past had made peace with the giants. Izo asked if elves lived in the city. The merchant replied that the people of the elves, unlike others, did not come to the city. They lived in their own village and had almost no contact with anyone. Only occasionally they could come to the merchants to exchange goods. Marius came up to them and apologized for the delay. It was unexpected for him that an audience with the king and the celebration itself would take place tomorrow. He looked tired. Izo came to the room assigned to him and thought that he had nothing to do until tomorrow. A servant came to him and informed him that Mrs. Diana had called him to her and was waiting in the garden. Izo came to the courtyard of the estate and saw that the girl, dressed in a training uniform, was standing against him with a training sword in her hands. Izo asked if the girl had decided to challenge him again. She said it would be the last lesson, so why not? During the battle, a tired Diana asked Izo if he would fight her seriously at least once. Izo replied that if she wanted to, then he would not restrain his strength, and began to lunge. The girl tried to block the blows, but did not notice how Izo's sword was right at her neck. The speed was so fast that she didn't even have time to notice this attack. She lost in just a couple of seconds. Diana was upset and dissatisfied with herself, but Izo began to praise her. He said that she was getting stronger day by day, and if she continued training, she would achieve unexpected heights. The girl was delighted and seemed to blossom before her eyes. The next day, Marius told the king about everything, and after the celebration, he officially became a count. The hastily prepared celebration was brilliant. Marius toasted and raised glasses with others in honor of the well-being of his estate. Izo stood with his glass to the side, dressed again as a representative of the upper class, and thought that he could cook some dishes that he had tried at the banquet today for Samia and Reich. Suddenly, he noticed Diana. She was wearing a luxurious dress, with a high hairstyle and a fan in her hands. Izo came up to her and said she was as beautiful as a rose. The girl covered her reddened cheeks with a fan and asked the blacksmith not to embarrass her. He replied that he spoke from the bottom of his heart and said that he would be sorry that he would not see her in such an image again. She asked why he decided that. 
but before Izo could say anything, the girl was immediately surrounded by noble youths, showering compliments and wanting to invite her to dance. They ousted Izo, and he didn't get to talk to Diana again all evening. The next day, he was ready to return home. Izo shook hands with Marius and said that he had to become a good count. He replied that he would try and ask the blacksmith to pick up the broken sword to fix it. Izo said that he himself wanted to restore the blade and then return it to Marius. But the count replied that due to the circumstances, he could not keep this sword and ask the blacksmith to keep it for good. Then Izo said that he would take care of it and keep it carefully. Diana never came out to say goodbye, and Izo was a little sad at heart because of that. After loading the sword into the wagon, Marius asked Izo to put another wagon with some cargo that he wanted to leave at his forge. Izo did not ask what was inside the box, and calmly allowed it to be loaded into the cart. When he and Camillo arrived at the house, the merchant reminded the blacksmith not to forget the luggage. Izo's curiosity was aroused, and he opened the box with interest to find out the contents. Two arms stretched out of the box, and a woman's voice complained that her shoulders were numb. It was Diana. Izo asked in shock what she was doing here, and the countess only smiled in response. Diana handed Izo a letter from her brother, which explained why Diana decided to secretly return to the forge. The man opened the package and began to read. Marius wrote that since Izo had read this text, their plan had succeeded, and he was sorry that he would not be able to see the surprised face of the blacksmith. And then, with an indignant look, Izo realized that this was the general plan not only of Diana and Morris, but also of Camillo. Then the letter said that Marius had become an earl and had lost two older brothers, so the circumstances around Diana had also changed. He was worried about her protection, and the place of people who wanted to see another person as a count. He was very worried about the fate of his younger sister, and therefore, at her own request, decided that it would be better for her to continue living in the blacksmith's house in the middle of the forest. Finally, Marius gave permission that if Izo wanted to, he could do whatever he wanted with Diana. Izo told himself that he would pretend that he had not read these lines. He told Diana that since she had come all this way, she would go home with him. The girl thanked Izo, clapped her hands with Camillo, and jumped out of the cart. The merchant drove back to the city, and Izo and Diana continued to walk along the path to the house. But suddenly, on the way, Diana frowned and said that she was probably imposing too much and would only be a burden to Izo. A man replied that if she had interfered with him, he would have sent her home, but, as she herself sees, they walked together to his house. Diana asked if it was really true. Izo replied that he was just a clumsy and stubborn blacksmith, and he didn't know how to lie, so he was definitely telling her the truth. Then he asked her to fill him up with just Izo, without the word mister, because family members are not addressed like that. Reich and Samia shouted welcome back. To Diana, the little dwarf said she knew their plan would go like clockwork. It turns out that the girls were also aware, and they were the first to come up with such a way that after the holiday, Diana would stay with them forever. Izo wanted to ask what they meant, but Reich said it was their girlish secret. The Izo Fords welcomed Diana into their family, and every day was full of smiles. The family had grown, which meant that it was necessary to expand. They spent a whole week on a new extension that became a room for Diana. They decided to make a separate bed for her, since the guest room was supposed to remain empty in case guests, and customers of weapons would come to them. And finally, the new room was ready. Diana, despite her title and background, worked like the others and was glad that she was able to contribute to the construction of the house in her own room. Izo handed Diana a sword and said that each of them had one. Samia explained that this is something like their family tradition. This pocket knife was of the highest quality and could cut through anything. The girl thanked them for the gift and they began to move her things to arrange the room. They discussed that they would have to stop by Camillo's next week and buy more sets of bed linen. Then they had dinner and went to bed. The next day, the whole family went to Camillo's store. The merchant greeted his friends, and Izo noticed that there were many times more people in the store. Camillo said it was all thanks to them. Now he was working with the Count's family, so there were more people. He then asked Izo if he was looking for an unusual ore. Then he said that the information was unreliable, but the Count said that Apoitakara would be in the capital soon. Hearing the word Apoitakara, Izo was very surprised. It was a legendary metal found in this world only in the north. Izo knew this because of the established knowledge that appeared in his mind as soon as he moved into this world. Camillo said he could hold some metal for Izo if he could find it. Izo asked to keep the metal for him and thanked Camillo. After that, they went outside to have a snack. The blacksmith said that during his departure, Samia, Reich and Diana worked hard, and thanks to them, they had an item this week that they were able to sell. He was grateful to them. 
Reich said she was glad Camilla was giving them news about the medals. Diana added that she would try to get in touch with her brother directly so that she would know about the news directly from the capital. Izo thought that looking for information about medals and the medals themselves in the big capital was the same as looking for a needle in a haystack. Then, he saw, not far from them, a group of mercenary adventurers who visited dungeons with monsters and took out relics, gold, magical artifacts, and rare materials. He thought that if you are not a blacksmith, it would be interesting to become an adventurer, and immediately imagined himself, Rika, Samia, and Diana in the clothes of mercenaries looking for adventure. This did not escape Samia. She quickly noticed that he was looking in the direction of the adventurers, and asked if he wanted to go somewhere on a trip. Izo replied that not at all. He came to this world with one goal and purpose, to become a blacksmith and live a peaceful rural life in his house. He had had enough adventures, and he didn't want them. After all, he didn't want to die anymore, but he didn't tell the girls that he had already died saving a cat once. This answer still did not suit Samia, and she stepped aside. Izo asked what he had done wrong. Diana said that every time he left, Samia was afraid he wouldn't come back. However, Izo himself never thought about it. Izo said that he was not going to leave his family. Diana smiled. Reich was delighted, but Samia continued to stand aside. After lunch, when they arrived home, they all began unloading materials and products from the wagon together. Samia came up to Izo and said that it smells like rain. Judging by the direction of the wind, it will be a long one. The blacksmith asked how long it would rain. The tigress replied that she did not know for sure, but probably for about a week. Izo said that if it was longer than three days, they would still need to get water for tomorrow and continue working. As a result, as Samia said, the rain was long and did not end in any way, and she could not even go hunting. In order not to sit around, they all harvested metal sheets together. Diana, having brought the logs, was surprised that they prepared the sheets themselves in the forge, although other craftsmen usually bought them. She was amazed at the strength of her friends. Samia and Reich flexed the small biceps on their arms and told them to be many times stronger than people. Of course, with the exception of Izo, who seemed to them to be the strongest in the world. It was still raining the next day. While the others were busy with the blanks, Izo decided to forge himself a new sword. He worked to the maximum of his abilities, and Reich said that when he works with all seriousness, it is very fascinating, and the products turn out amazing. Diana added that maybe she didn't know much about it, but the knife really looked beautiful. Izo explained that he had to spend the last knife to create a sword. Otherwise, he just couldn't create the right sword. He assumed that he was not relaxed enough there, and because of his stiffness, he could not work with his soul. Now, in his native forge, everything was in order and he could make high-quality products again. He was glad that he hadn't lost his skills. But anyway, he needs to figure it out so that in the future he can make great products anywhere. It continued to rain for several more days, and they forged new products. It seemed to them that it would rain for ages. It finally passed, and the stars lit up the night. The next morning, the whole family happily went outside. Samia said she wanted to go hunting. Izo told the others that there was a lot of energy in himself. Reich told him that she was in a good mood because they had all lived together these days without leaving. Izo said he was glad of it, and Reich told him reproachfully that he did not understand a girl's heart at all. After that, the two of them went back to work. When they worked together, the sound of their alternating hammers was like music. Reich noticed it too. After that, they sat down to lunch. As a result, Samia went hunting with Diana. The man asked the assistant why she so rarely goes out for a walk and did not want to go with the others to the forest. After all, she only got out of the forge when they went to the city to visit Camillo and when she went to the lake to wash. The girl replied that, as a dwarf, she was used to this lifestyle and did not feel the need to go out for walks often. She worked and studied next to her mentor and she loved it, but she was grateful that Izo was worried about her. After lunch, they continued to work and suddenly, someone began to knock loudly on their door. Izo opened the door to the guest and saw Helen on the threshold. He greeted an old acquaintance and invited her to come into the house. Izo asked Helen what was wrong with her sword. The mercenary replied that she was waiting for a long hike, so she decided to drop by the forge for diagnostics so that he would fix it if something was found. Izo picked up Helen's sword and asked if she used it often. She replied that she had been using it continuously for a whole week as soon as she got her hands on it and had regular workouts. After that, she also had a run-in with bandits nearby, which she considered exactly the same training. Izo thought that Helen wielded with very great power, but even so, it was very difficult to damage his sword. Helen said that this sword was perfect, and she felt invincible with it. 
He saved her life many times with his sharpness. She thanked Izo for that. But he said he didn't need any thanks because it was his job. Helen shook his hand and Izo felt her grip was just as strong. Meanwhile, Reich was cleaning the workshop. After the inspection, the blacksmith said that in its current state, the weapon would last her a long time, but just in case he would fix it, so he asked the girl to wait a little. Helen asked Izo if she could watch him work. The man did not object, and Helen happily slapped him on the back, after which they went into the workshop. Izo began to hammer away at the sword, examining it through the ability of his eyes. There were almost no problems on the sword, except for small scratches, which he decided to smooth out. Very soon, he returned the finished weapon back to Helen. She was delighted, and said it felt like he was brand new. Izo said he was more amazed that she could see the difference. Then he asked if the scabbard needed to be repaired. Helen replied that they were not broken, and then Izo decided to remove the scratches on the second blade, since Helen was wielding two swords at once. Izo asked Helen if she enjoyed watching him work. The girl replied that, looking at his work, she felt like a craftsman. The fact was that her father was a saddler, and she loved to watch him work, and now it brought back memories to her. For some reason, she had to leave the house, and she asked Izo if he wanted to know more. The blacksmith replied that it was rude to pry into a woman's past. Then Helen asked if he had had a sad experience in this regard. He replied that yes, but if there was delicious food in her story, then he wouldn't mind listening. As soon as Izo finished with the second sword, Samia and Diana returned home. The tigress greeted Helen as a friend, and Diana enthusiastically asked if she was the famous Helen Sword of Thunder. The mercenary replied that it was. Diana could barely contain the squeal of her admiration and delight. Then Izo decided that as payment he wanted Helen to train with Diana since he was her idol. The mercenary replied that she would be happy to do so. They went into the courtyard to fight with wooden swords, and Izo decided to sharpen the maples. Samia watched the fight, plucking the birds she had caught hunting. After a while, Izo sharpened the swords, and Diana was smashed to smithereens. The blacksmith asked the guest, how did she rate Diana? Helen replied that she had a good base, but there were unnecessary movements. It was beautiful, but pointless. If you give her time and a lot of practice, then she will definitely succeed. Diana was upset because she wanted to hear more praise. Izo said it was an honest assessment of Diana's swordsmanship, and nothing less could be expected from a combat veteran. Helen said that for a person from the palace, she was really very strong. She even dared to say that Diana was the strongest of them. After that, Helen asked if Izo had trained Diana. He replied positively, and she said she knew it, because Diana's feints were similar to his. The blacksmith was amazed that Helen was able to memorize his technique, even though they had only fought once. Diana asked Izo if it was true that he stood up to Helen for 15 minutes. He replied that it was, and Helen was his first opponent with a pair of weapons. The countess did not expect to hear that they not only trained with swords together, but with two at once. He amazed her more and more. Helen offered to fight with Izo. But he refused, explaining that he was a blacksmith, and was completely unsuitable as an opponent to a veteran of battles. Besides, it was already late, so he invited his girlfriend to stay with them for the night, because no matter how strong she was, it was still dangerous to walk one night. Samia finally finished plucking the birds, it took her all day. Reich was busy at the forge, so she apologized to the tigress for not being able to help her today. Finally, Izo and Helen agreed to walk to the city together as the blacksmith needed new materials. When they reached the gate to the city, the guard was surprised that the famous thunder sword was walking with the blacksmith and looking at the rest of the company, consisting of an aristocrat, a dwarf and a beastman. He was completely confused as to why this blacksmith was so strange. Izo told Helen that they would go to Camillo's store. The girl had to go the other way. She said goodbye to her friends and said that she would definitely come to them when she needed to repair weapons again. The new product that Izo and Reich were working on was a halberd. The blacksmith told the merchant that he wanted him to sell the halberd to the count as it would be perfect for the guards of the city. Camillo replied that he would do everything and then added that he had not had an apoitakara yet. But there was something else. He handed over the bundle containing mithril and asked Izo to make a rapier out of it. The blacksmith asked if he could leave the emblem of his workshop on the rapier, and after hearing a positive answer, agreed to the order. He was glad that he could finally use something other than steel. Back at the forge, Izo said that they would conquer Mithril today. Reich said she had never seen anyone working with Mithril, even in her own home, so she was looking forward to it. Samia and Diana asked for permission to observe the process. Izo gave them his consent and got to work. Silver begins to melt at a temperature at which iron can be processed 
but with mithril everything was different. Izo decided to start forging when he reached a temperature just below the processing of steel. Usually, from such a blow, which the blacksmith made, it was already possible to change the shape of steel, but there were no changes on mithril. He said that the metal was very unruly, and it was difficult to work with it even with a hammer, because after four or five strokes it was already cooling down and had to be heated again. This slowed down the process and brought it back to the very beginning. Reich said tensely that it would be clearly beyond the power of an ordinary blacksmith to handle mithril. Izo thought that this was the first time he had encountered such material since he entered this world. But no matter how hard it was, he wasn't going to give up. He decided to use his reading ability to the maximum and do everything necessary. With the help of his eyes, Izo saw the structure of the material. There were no irregularities in it, like steel, so he was immediately able to concentrate on lengthening the material. He concentrated and was able to see the slightest details and transforms mithril with his power. The girl said that the sound of Izo's hammer on mithril was like music. After a while, the man asked them if they were bored just sitting there and watching. The girls replied in unison that they were satisfied with everything. After that, he asked Reich to bring a whetstone. The dwarf asked, wouldn't he do the tempering first? Was it possible to skip it? The blacksmith replied that this material is very strong and does not need to be tempered. Looking at the foil blank, Izo thought that the materials in the other world were on a completely different level. While engaged in sharpening, he conducted an internal dialogue, telling himself that his feelings tell him that if he relaxed his vigilance even a little, the entire workpiece would be spoiled. He shouldn't have relaxed until the very end. Soon the blade was ready. Diana volunteered to try out the rapier, but Izo warned that it could be very tricky, and the hilt was not ready yet, so the girl had to be extremely careful not to get hurt. He had heard that weapons from Mithril were called light as a bird's feather and he was excited to find out if this was true. Diana suggested going outside. They went out into the courtyard of the house, and the countess immediately began to lunge forward. Samia was a little worried, and decided to share her feelings with Izo. She told him that Diana had been looking at her strangely lately. He asked what she meant by that. The tigress explained that Diana was watching her strangely, for a very long time and stared intently from time to time. And it bothered her. She felt hostility from the girl, and it scared her. She asked Reich if she felt something like that. The girl replied that she had noticed some changes, but could not say anything for sure. She assumed that since Samia is a beastman, she feels much more than others, which means she saw and noticed more as well. Samia shouted back that they were too careless about other people's problems. At that moment, Diana came to them and asked what was going on. Samia got scared and clung to Izo, and he suggested that she ask Diana directly why she was behaving like that. Samia asked, and Diana, realizing how she looked from the outside, bowed and began to apologize. The tigress asked what she was apologizing for. Diana covered her face with her hands so that no one could see her embarrassment and rosy cheeks, and said that the fact was that Samia was very cute, so she was constantly staring at her. Diana liked her fluffy ears, ponytail, and fur, which was probably very soft. But she couldn't touch it without permission. It would be ugly, so she just watched the tigress. Samia allowed Diana to stroke her ears, and Izo felt that he also wanted to stroke the kitty. Izo, Reich, and Samia were mesmerized by Diana's graceful movements with a rapier in her hands. Izo saw in her movements the same technique as Marius, and drew parallels that the sister and brother were very similar to each other. And immediately the image of the deceased Carol appeared in his thoughts. His thoughts clouded, and he thought that a weapon is just a tool that wounds and takes life. Whether it's a small knife or a sword, it's not so important. Their purpose is the same. After checking, Izo asked Diana if it was easier to fight with this rapier than with a regular sword. The girl replied that the difference was noticeable. She spent less effort holding the weapon in her hand, and therefore it was much easier and faster for her to move with it. Samia and Reich brought a large log and suggested that Diana try to chop it to test the sharpness and strength of the rapier. Diana gladly agreed, and before she could make a lunge, the rapier went right through the log. She, like Samia and Reich, did not expect at all that it would be so easy. Diana told Izo that she didn't even notice how she cut the bar, as if she hadn't struck at all. Izo replied that it only showed the fact that the girl had become stronger. Diana handed him the rapier, and the blacksmith saw that the blade had not deformed in any way, and there were no chips on the edges. Reich suggested conducting another test, and tying a piece of metal to a log with ropes, the girl suggested trying to cut it. One slight movement, and the metal was split, and the blade was not damaged in any way again. 
Izo picked up the sword and told the others that he had created something that he had not been able to do before. There were moments in his eyes when he gave a knife to Samia, killed a bear and robbers. And all this was done with simple knives and a spear. Now, holding such a sharp rapier, he thought that he did not want to sell such a terrible weapon to just anyone. Of course, he did not think that only one sword could turn the world upside down, because he had already made other models of swords to order. They were usually made of steel, but if you create a weapon from mithril or a more durable material, then these weapons, in the wrong hands, can destroy not only people. The sharpness of this sword is capable of mowing down rocks like grass. With this weapon in hand, nothing will stop the wearer. And maybe one day, this sword will decide the fate of the world itself. Izo decided that he shouldn't use his gift too carelessly. After all, his products can change the fate of this world. Does he have to decide for himself who gets this sword? For a moment, the blacksmith was overcome with horror and fear, he froze, and there was excitement on his face. All three girls tensed, and Samia asked if everything was okay with Izo. The blacksmith was still in his thoughts. He felt that his feelings when making a sword were different now than when he was making an order for Helen. He looked at Diana and thought that he had already interfered with history by creating an Amor family heirloom and this served as the murder of one brother by another. He never thought that work could cause him great stress and he wanted to share his experiences with others. He asked his friends if they thought he should have sold the sword to anyone. After all, he could fall into the wrong hands and bring trouble to their world. They saw his destructive power. And even though weapons go hand in hand with people, he was very afraid to make a mistake and sell this sword to the wrong person. Will he be able to bear the consequences of his choice? This anxiety was eating him up from the inside. After he told about it, he immediately felt how pathetic he looked in the eyes of the girls. They were probably disappointed in him, because now he was not that staunch, strong, with an inner core head of the family. He was timid and weak. He was ready to accept that each of them would want to leave home, unable to stand living with such a pathetic creature like him. But suddenly, the girls laughed. Diana said that Izo turned out to be just an ordinary person like all of them. It was difficult for them to imagine that there was an ordinary gentle person inside him, considering what incredible products he could create. Reich said that as a dwarf, she did not know at all that the master could think about such things, but she understood his feelings. After all, every blacksmith feels such responsibility. This feeling had been instilled in her by her older brothers since childhood, and she thought that all creators face this kind of thing. Diana said that the creator is not omniscient and cannot know in advance who will eventually get his sword, a defender of the weak or a bloodthirsty tyrant. After all, the blacksmith is not responsible for the thoughts of his customers. Therefore, Izo should not burden himself with such worries. Samia said that if Izo is still faced with such depressing thoughts, he can always share them with them. They will comfort and support him. After all, they were a family. After that, Samia slapped him on the back to cheer him up. Izo was glad that he had such good friends. All three girls hugged him tightly. The blacksmith slapped his cheeks and cheerfully said that he needed to continue working. He wanted to create again, for the sake of his clients, whoever they were. After all, he had a family that would always support him in any choice. Samia said that at last Izo began to smile and looked cool again. They returned to the workshop, and Izo began to put the finishing touches to finish the rapier. 